Helium is an extremely abundant element in our universe, as it comprises around 25% of all its matter. Yet here on Earth, it is quite a rare element. You see, helium is an extremely light element, the second lightest to only hydrogen, so it has a tendency to rise up the atmosphere and eventually escape the Earth into outer space. But you might be wondering why helium has this tendency while hydrogen remains abundant on Earth despite being even lighter than helium. The reason for this is because helium is an inert gas and doesn't tend to chemically bond with other elements. For this reason, hydrogen gets trapped on Earth through means of chemical bonds, while helium, over time, gets lost in space. Since helium is so rare on Earth, the main way to obtain it is through radioactive decay, specifically alpha decay, where a helium nucleus is emitted from a heavier element's nucleus as it transforms into another lighter element. These characteristics led to helium being an element well hidden from scientific exercises for quite a long time. And of the lighter elements on the periodic table, it was not discovered until nearly a century after most of its light counterparts. While elements like nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen were discovered around the 1770s, helium wasn't discovered until 1868, stemming from an intriguing coincidence regarding two scientists, French astronomer Pierre Jules Janssen and English astronomer Joseph Norman Lockyer. Jules Janssen was born in 1824 in Paris, France, the son of a well-known clarinetist. He studied mathematics and physics at the University of Paris, eventually becoming a professor of architecture there in 1864. Jules integrated himself with various topics of study in math and science, ranging from geophysics to architecture to astronomy. Norman Lockyer, on the other hand, was born 12 years after Janssen in Rugby, Warwickshire, England in 1836. He received an education through travel throughout France and Switzerland and took up astronomy as a passion-fueled hobby. In the 1860s, Lockyer's passion tunneled in specifically on spectroscopy, the field of study that observes spectra of light emitted by objects. In 1868, a rare event occurred on Earth that attracted both scientists and brought their stories together, a total solar eclipse. Janssen saw this as an opportunity to learn more about the sun's atmosphere, as it would be visible during the eclipse, and he traveled to Gunter, India to observe it. He focused specifically on a layer of the atmosphere of the sun, known as the chromosphere. Upon observations of the chromosphere, he noticed very bright lines in the sun's spectra. This was important for two main reasons. The first was that it showed that the sun's chromosphere is gaseous in nature. The second was that it showed that the spectral lines emitted by the chromosphere were so bright that the chromosphere can be observed even without the need for an eclipse. Janssen from this point forward began to observe the sun's chromosphere in broad daylight, but unbeknownst to him, Lockyer was doing the same thing at the same time and the two's observations would converge in the short months to come. On October 20th, 1868, Norman Lockyer was in England, about 5,000 miles away from Janssen, and was observing spectral emissions from the sun when he noticed something peculiar. In the emission spectra resided a bright yellow line, one that was very close on the visible light spectrum to the already known D lines, usually called D1 and D2, that indicated the presence of sodium. This line, though, was most certainly not one of the two D lines, and Lockyer therefore named the line D3. Lockyer wasn't sure if this was a previously unseen emission line of a known element or an emission line of an entirely new element, but he made it clear that the D3 line was a new, never-before-seen emission line in his reported results to the French Academy of Sciences. The exact same day that Lockyer's findings reached the French Academy, though, Janssen's findings on the composition of the chromosphere also reached the French Academy. Janssen, however, failed to point out the newly discovered D3 line, even though it was present in his findings. So, although both received credit for the discovery that the sun's chromosphere is gaseous in nature, it was up for debate as to whether they both got credit for the discovery of the D3 line. Regardless, the hunt to unveil the mask behind the D3 line was on, and many subsequent discoveries would verify its nature as a spectral line of an entirely new element.
When Janssen and Lockyer's findings were first presented to the French Academy, they were met with mixed reviews. Many dismissed the idea of an entirely new element. Others conceded that there might be a new element, but that it only resided in the sun and could not be found or manufactured on Earth. This speculation would be put to rest 14 years later by an Italian physicist by the name of Luigi Palmieri. Palmieri was observing lava flow from the volcano Mount Vesuvius using a spectroscope when he noticed the same yellow D3 line that had been observed in the sun's chromosphere nearly a decade earlier. From there, it became clear. Whatever was behind the D3 line not only existed in the sun, but also existed on Earth. Still, it would take another 12 years before the D3 line would be proven to come from a new element, and this proof would come from a British chemist by the name of William Ramsey. Ramsey is known for discovering most of the noble gases, with the help of English physicist Lord Rayleigh, for which he won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1904. It was in 1895, one year after his first noble gas discovery, argon, when Ramsey would uncover the mystery of the D3 line. Ramsey was working with cleavite, a compound of minerals composed mainly of uranium oxide, in hopes of isolating argon for further study. He treated the cleavite with sulfuric acid, hoping to isolate argon, but instead he released an unusual gas unfamiliar to him. Ramsey sent a sample of this gas to Lockyer, who, upon observing the mixture with a spectroscope, noticed what he described as a glorious yellow effulgence. The D3 line matched perfectly to this new gas. Ramsey then conducted a series of tests with the gas to make sure it wasn't a form of hydrogen, and upon confirmation that it was a gas of its own, Lockyer dubbed the element helium, after the Greek word for the sun, helios. The discovery of helium has many contributing scientists and spans a time period of around 30 years, demonstrating just how difficult the gas is to obtain and to observe due to its rarity. Debate still rages on today about Janssen's credit and whether or not it is justified. Some say the spectral lines in his findings are enough to give credit despite not mentioning it, while others say that pointing out the anomaly and recognizing it as something new is required. Regardless, Janssen's contribution is significant, and the coincidental simultaneity with that of Lockyer's results makes for quite an interesting moment in both astronomical and chemical history. Lockyer himself went on to found and become the first editor for the scientific journal Nature which went on to become one of the most influential scientific journals of all time. The fortuitous story of Janssen and Lockyer led not only to a new element on the periodic table, but also to an improvement in scientific communication for many years to come. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing. Click here if you want to see more scientific progress made during this time period. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.